South Canterbury. Its rivers tumble eastwards on broad beds as they drain melting snows from the Southern Alps. These rivers sometimes run at barely a trickle, but they can also rage out of control. The midstream islands appear and disappear on these shifting, ever-changing waterways. Yet these temporary high spots are the nesting sites for one of New Zealand's ornithological oddities. Its camouflage is near perfect. This bird has taken its colours from its surroundings on the splashed stones of the grey wacky shingle. It claims another home besides this one, but what makes it unique is its bill. No other bird in the world has a bill with a right-hand turn. Only New Zealand's rye bill has this. North Island mudflat, teeming with invertebrate life. Come autumn, Rybills move north where simple needs are well taken care of. Here there's copious mud to paddle about in feeding and a high dry roost where they can sleep and preen themselves. They favour sheltered harbours and nowhere do they flock in greater numbers than to the bleached shell banks of Miranda on the Firth of Thames. April. Rivals wheel and bank in spectacular manoeuvres to herald their arrival on the Firth. Here, at their winter quarters, life has lived according to different rules than apply down south on the breeding ground. There are no pairs or mates, just the flock. And the flocks of every kind of bird that winter here are dictated to by one thing, the tide. High tide, and the wading birds dutifully move to the shell banks. Knots, godwits, Oyster catchers, turnstones, stilts and turns roost side by side. But the rivals prefer to rest away from the others. Here, the tide calls the tune. As it recedes, it announces feeding time. For the little birds with a bend in their bill, early feeding consists of rather aimless pecking and probing while some use the bathing facilities provided from the tiny freshwater rivulets. The water pulls back further and a vast khaki tablecloth is uncovered, laden with worms, crabs, bivalves and tiny crustaceans. Mudflat feeding is communal. All the wading birds tuck in, shoulder to shoulder. As the tide gets lower still, a reason for the rye bill can be observed. All rivals have this bent, and without exception, it's to the right. But why? It could be an adaptation to mudflat feeding to give the rivals an advantage over other wading birds. All waders seem to peck or probe the mud, and some have evolved highly efficient bills to do the job. The oyster catcher is prober supreme. No rival could possibly compete with the deftness of its long, carrot-coloured bill. On the other hand, the stilt, like the rye bill, sometimes picks and sometimes probes for food. 
but long spindly legs are its adaptation. High and dry, it feeds ahead of the tide, getting first helping. The godwit is another prober. The slightly upturned bill is thrust eyeball deep to take the choicest worms. But the rybill does have one ace, and at near low tide, it plays it. By twisting its head and dabbing its bent bill, it sweeps tiny waterborne crustaceans into its mouth. At full speed, it rhythmically slaps the water 100 times a minute, and slowed down, the spoon action of the sideways bill can be seen. It's called sweep feeding, and very lucrative it is too. Each sweep causes the tiny shrimps to lift off the mud and move ahead in the water, only to be swept up in the next mouthful. No other bird is equipped to get at these tasty morsels. The sweep feeding bill may be the rye bill's trademark, but it also has a personality all of its own. A bird will often travel well out of its way to make a point. These vigorous bunts are often observed, but there appears to be little explanation. The tide returns. It's time for the waders to roost. Each year, rivals fly to Miranda from Canterbury, where they breed. But this 1,000-kilometre journey pales in comparison with the flight of another wader found up here. Godwits take a final probe or two before retiring. Their flight is an impressive 15,000 kilometre migration from the Arctic. Miranda's great company of birds fit into two groups. There's the international travellers and the domestic flyers. And naturally enough, bird watchers are attracted to this busy bird terminus. The waders mill about as if looking for some lost relation, or perhaps it's lost luggage. The tall godwits will soon leave for their long distance breeding appointment as will the smaller knots already showing their red breeding feathers. Knots are the world's farthest flying wader. They breed in the far north of the Arctic Circle. White-fronted terns are more modest migrants. Their journey is only trans-Tasman. The most numerous species at Miranda is the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher, Saipo for short. Dressed in black tops and white waistcoats, and of course their carroty bills, their flight plans, like rye bills, are strictly domestic. The tide ebbs the cycle begins again. First in to feed are those with a height advantage, a pied stilt. It joins a lone heron and a few eager godwits. Again, as the mud is exposed, the roosts empty and the bird watchers depart. But nearby is a possible threat to the birds they've just left. A drainage canal here, a stop bank there, and another tidal flat is reclaimed. Farming 
industry and housing are all eating into the Firth and the other bird harbours of the north, particularly the Kuiper. It's a slow and subtle process, but each acre reclaimed is another lost of this unique ecosystem. Wading birds, for all their fancy feeding, need this mud. They'll suffer if more is reclaimed. August, winter's end. Miranda subtly changes seasonal gear. The days become longer and some birds are becoming restless. Every day, ryebills and oyster catchers take short flights to nowhere in particular. Then the oyster catchers disperse for their breeding ground. Ryebills are slower to respond to seasons change. They continue to flock in characteristic formations. But hormonal changes are taking place. Their breeding plumage, a dark breastband, appears, and then during August, they too depart for the rivers of Canterbury. Spring brings changes to the land. The thaw has started in the Alps. The Cass River runs with snow-fed water. A clean river now is important to the Rybills. The waters rinse silt from the riverbed, leaving clean stones near water's edge where the birds feed on insects. To guarantee the steady supply of insects, Rybills also nest close to water's edge. Their nests are sited only centimetres above the flowing river on midstream islands. And the islands are part of the Cass River's delta system as it feeds Lake Tekapo. Rivals waste little time in re-establishing last year's territory. And if their partners of last year are still alive, they quickly set up house again. After a token courtship, mating occurs, and two eggs, the colour of stones, are laid invisibly on a nest of stones. Incubation of the eggs is shared. Unlike her mate, the female has no black marking over her eyes. Meanwhile, he takes insects on the back waters of their island home. The female feeds about midday, but changeover never occurs at the nest. She runs off the eggs, and a little later, he shuffles on. This behavior seems to deter, or at least confuse, predators. But even safely surrounded by a watery moat, their eggs could be preyed upon. A black-backed gull. He stands astride the eggs and cocks one eye as it passes. The superbly camouflaged eggs are their own best defence and by leaving the nest, the bird confuses the gull as to where they are. and the gull departs, seeing only stones, stones, and more stones. The birds are already well into nesting. 
In fact, the most punctual in getting their eggs laid have already produced. Chicks are nidificous, which means as soon as they hatch, they can walk. The Rybill is a true New Zealander and its behaviour, its camouflage and its bent bill have all evolved for a purpose over many millions of years. But oddly, nature has selected birds that nest on islands less than half a metre above rivers. And these rivers can change their mood very quickly indeed. Late snow and a rapidly rising river. Extremely heavy high country rain is flooding the Cass. Spring floods are by far the greatest taker of rybill lives, particularly of eggs and chicks. An exceptional half a metre of rain falls in one day. Most of the rybill islands have gone underwater. The rain passes, but the snow remains, and beneath it, who knows how many nests have been destroyed. This banded dotterel chick is clearly confused. The snow has upset its concealment behaviour. Normally it can lie low, secure in its resemblance to rocks and twigs, but out here, its camouflage coat matches nothing. By the following morning, the snow has all but disappeared, and on the riverbed begins a time of reckoning. A black-fronted tern assesses the fate of its eggs. Flooded. The chilled embryos are dead. Nevertheless, the hapless tern carries on with its natural urge to brood. But our rival pair were luckier. They left their nest for a few minutes at Flood Peak. One egg is being brooded, but the other is damaged. It lies a short distance upstream, having been pushed out of the nest. Another nest. And this rival chick should be walking easily by now. A parent hovers nearby, confused by the chick's abnormal behaviour. The chick is a casualty of the floodwaters, chilled in its egg just prior to hatching. It's unlikely to live. The nesting rybills have suffered great losses as a result of the flood on the cast. Most nests have been swept away and nearly all the chicks have died, including the sick one. But in the face of disaster, the rival produces another surprise. On the end of its list of special features must go another, the ability to re-nest should its first attempt fail. The males quickly sort out their territories. Many midstream islands have disappeared and on the remaining islands, the borders are hotly defended. It's a game of brinkmanship along an invisible border. The further one invades the other's territory, the more it loses its nerve and vice versa.
competition is keen this time because many old nest sites are like this. Clogged with river silt. The birds won't re-nest here. Only the spring thaw and its cleansing waters benefit the rybill. The flood has brought a sterile layer of silt. This muddy carpet seals the riverbed and scarcely any insects are to be found. Rybills have gone hungry since the flood. Other birds, like the smartly attired banded dotterel, don't mind the silt. From birth, dotterel chicks take berries and seeds to complement their insect diet. But the rybills depend on insects. And all their favourite feeding spots can offer is very lean pickings indeed. In fact, it's come down to this. Food is in such short supply that birds are found out on the edge of the main river scouting for the very occasional washed up insect. But most continue to promenade the silty bed while their mates get on with incubation. This is our bird, the rival that removed one of her eggs from the nest just after the flood. It's not known if she's re-nested or whether her other egg is hatched. It appears that it has hatched, and not very long ago. This wobbly chick is possibly the only one to have defied the flood on this part of the river. And it's only hours old, just dry of its egg fluid. There's so much to see if you're new to the world and a lot more to learn, but some things are automatic. A mother's call of alarm. It freezes but sneaks a look at its first sky-born predator. Should the gull continue to hover, the chick will remain frozen. Until it gets the all clear. Like the chicks of other wading birds, the strong-legged rybill is mobile immediately from birth. Its fluffy down is a lighter shade than its parents' colouring. The chick matches rather the dry, dusty veneer left on sunbaked stones. Wonderment at this strange new world is fleeting. Feeding becomes its priority. The chicks are born with the bend in their bill, which would appear of little, if any, advantage for feeding on the riverbed. However, the bent bill came about precisely because of conditions on the riverbed. At least, that's the view held by Ray Pierce, who's well acquainted with the rye bills here on the cast. In particular, he's well acquainted with the way rye bills feed. Over three summers, as part of his study, he's counted the number of times rybills peck per minute and the number of times they probe per minute, and he's come up with some interesting data. Ray has also recorded a third quite peculiar method of feeding, which this bird will only use if it finds a good area of clear stones. But the stones are too silty and the insect population is still sparse.
but now it appears in a better area and begins to feed this other way. By inclining its head and dabbing its bill, it very neatly trims unseen insects from underneath stones. It's called tactile feeding and utilizes the bend in the bill just as much as sweep feeding does in the tide up north. Tactile feeding is of use mainly in the heat of the day and in cold conditions when insects seek shelter under stones. The rather bolder theory of the bend is that it began during the glacial period of our history. In much colder conditions, insects were less active and lay dormant under stones for long periods. A mutant or freak bird with a bent bill was produced in a population with straight bills. This mutation was beneficial. It enabled the bird and its offspring to get more food, and so the kink was slowly bred into the population. But in 1980, glaciers couldn't be further from the Cass. Temperatures hover in the high 30s. During his summers on the Cass and the Rakaia, Ray Pierce has gained valuable information on our little known wader. His main concern has been feeding, but inevitably, he's seen their problems, both natural and unnatural. Blackback gulls reside on the shingle, but well clear of any passing flood. The gulls are rival predators, and they take what they can, but it isn't much. Many more eggs and chicks go in the floods. But down on the riverbed, the rivals face a quite unexpected, gaily clad enemy. Lupins. Lupins have pretty flowers. So pretty, in fact, that seed has been sown to beautify the riverbeds. Unfortunately, lupins compete with rivals for the midstream islands, and the plants always win. Lupins now cover many nest sites and are putting a lot of pressure on the birds. And pressure is being felt as great chunks of riverbed are being removed by other agents. Beyond the hydro dam, a lake will soon be formed and no rival with the very best of intentions can nest 50 feet underwater. Downstream, silt builds up as the harnessed river no longer has floods or thaws. Hydro dams could be used to cleanse the river by a simulated thaw just before nesting, but it is yet to be attempted. Eyes down, a turn scans the cast for fish. It's now March, the month that begins in hot summer and ends in cool autumn. The riverbed still shimmers in the heat, but the first snows have already dusted the hills. And down on Shingley Isles, most rivals have already moved on. Their year is complete. The floods and loss of breeding ground have been overcome up to a point. After two attempts, the young have been fledged and got away. For the little wader with some strange ways, it's that time again. Time to be away up north for a change of personality. For a start, it'll mean an all seafood diet. The private pair will join the public flock. The tumbling river will become lapping tide. Their feet will tread shell bank, not shingle. In fact, the only thing that won't change will be the bent. <laughs> 